Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning that your word does not return void, but it does accomplish what it's sent forth to accomplish. Help me to articulate the word in such a way that uh, we're able to understand and perceive what you're saying to the church. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Father. As you know, as a church, our kind of a mission uh, statement is to model Jesus and to share his love, okay? And so in, in modeling Jesus, we, we have to go back to the word of God and, and see what Jesus had to say about different situations, how he, how he uh, dealt with life uh, and how he lived, because we want to model him. Because what happens is over the years, we begin to pick up a lot of uh, tradition that has been put on the church because of the cultures that people lived in uh, or the, just the culture of the church that has come in, and we look at it almost as it's the way it is, but we always have to go back to the Bible and, and research that for ourselves. And so I want the question I have for you today as a church is, are you Jesus-centered? What would your answer be? Yes. Awesome. So we're going to look at that together to see if we truly are a Jesus-centered church this morning. How, how, how many would like to do that? Uh, starting at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. And this word God, we hear God in the English, but in the Hebrew, that word God is actually Elohim. And Elohim is actually plural. It says, in the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. The actual translation is, in the beginning, divine magistrates created the heavens and the earth. Now, why am I saying that? Because from the very opening of the Bible, we see the Trinity being spoken of in the very first verse. In the beginning, divine magistrates created the heavens and the earth. And many people say, well, I don't understand. And the Jews say, but there's only one true God. And that is true. But we have to understand the makeup of the Trinity as unified one divine being. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Okay? The Lord our God is one. I'm going to put this down because it's acting up on me today. The Lord our God is one. All right? That word one actually is the word echad. And I, can, I can't do the, the Hebrew, you know, how they roll their throat or whatever. But it's, but it's echad. Okay? Can you say that with me? Echad actually, um, it actually means properly united. So when the Bible says the Lord our God is one, it's saying uh, the Lord our God is properly united in, in unity. All right? And I, and I understand sometimes it's because I don't understand how the Jews don't see this because they speak Hebrew, that that word actually means unity. It doesn't mean one individual. It means unity. Unity. So this scripture actually says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is unified. Can you say unified? So God is in unity. The Trinity is in unity together. One God in three persons. And we see that in the scripture very clearly. And that word is echad, which means unity, properly unified, alike, all together. That's what it means. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24... We see this word being used again, Genesis 2.24. And because I'm, I'm sharing a topic that many people could yell and say, you know, he's creating false doctrine. I have to give you a lot of scripture because I want you to walk through this together with me. And we can look at this together. It says here, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined together with his wife. And they shall become a chad, flesh. They shall become one flesh. They will become unified. The word achad stems from the word achad, which actually means uh, one thought. And so God is giving us a very clear picture. Now, when my wife and I got married, we didn't morph into one being. How many know we didn't become one person? We became one in unity. We, we represent one another and we're unified. We're one couple. And it's very, very interesting to understand Throughout the scripture, that God is in three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see it all through the scripture. 
Here's another verse, Exodus 21, 18, has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But it has a word I want you to see, so we're going to read it together here. If men contend with each other, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die, uh, but is confined to his bed. Okay, and then it goes on to say what the punishment for that is. But what I want to focus on here is if the men contend with each other, and one strikes the other. That word one is a different word. That word is ish. Can you say ish? That word actually means an individual person. A individual person. A personality individual to itself. And so what people have done is they've tried to say, well, the Lord our God is an individual person. But the Bible doesn't say it. The Bible says God is echad, which means he's plural in unity. Do you see the difference? And so it's important for us to understand that. I'm going to get to the reason why it's important in just, just a few minutes. We have to understand we have one God, and he identifies himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's why at a traditional wedding, and this used to bother me because I didn't understand. How many have been to like a traditional Christian wedding? And this is what is usually said at the very end after the wedding ceremony, everything is done. The minister gets up and he says, and I now introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. Travis Blaze. How many, you know what I'm talking about? Well, why don't they say, I introduce Mr. Travis and Mrs. Camilla Blaze. Is the minister chauvinistic? Is, is, uh, you know, is a woman losing her identity? No, what's happening is the two are becoming one and it's significant that she represents me and I represent her and I become her covering, but she still has her own identity. But it's spiritual understanding. Do you guys see that? And it's the same thing with, with the Trinity. Jesus is in submission to the Father and the Holy Spirit is in submission to the Son. There's, there's an authority structure even in the, in, in the Trinity. Jesus himself said, the Father is greater than I am. Didn't he say that? Jesus is God. He's, he's God the Son, but there's an order of authority within the Trinity. And we'll see that as we begin to study through this. All right. Let's look at um, 1 John chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. 1 John 1, 2 to 3. The life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Next verse. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, and you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, say the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, so we as believers, our relationship with God is multifaceted. And it's, it, we have to understand that if we're going to mature. Because here we're being told by John, the apostle of Jesus, that he, our fellowship is not only with the Father, but it's also with the Son, Jesus Christ. And in many times, Paul even says at the end of his writings, that we have communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How many remember reading that? May the communion of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost be with you. We have a, an amazing relationship, and we can understand the difference between the three divine persons of the Godhead. It makes Christianity a lot of fun. Amen? And so, looking at this, let's move on. So, we see all these distinctions in the Word of God about the Trinity... And we have to understand that Jesus was with the Father. The Bible says in, in Philippians that he laid down his divinity and he became devoid of his supernatural power and became a man as we are to teach us how to submit and live under the Father's authority. That's what he did. He didn't come in his own authority. He didn't come in his own power. He came in the power of his Father. And he began to show the world what the Father was like. I'll show you some scriptures for that. John chapter 17 Verse 20 to 24 it says here, Jesus is praying and he's praying for all believers. Does that include you and I? That includes you and I. So he's praying for us. And this is awesome. He says, I do not pray for these alone being his disciples, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word, which is us, and that they may all be one. So 
God wants us to be one. Does that mean that we morph into one person? No, of course not. It means we become hechad. We become unified together in thought and purpose. And he says, I declare that the church will be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. We see this word one all over the place. That the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in unity. The word one again. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. See, this is really cool because this scripture is telling me that God loves you and I as he loved Jesus. Did you know that? God's love for you is the same love that he had for his son that was with him from eternity past. That's a love that, I mean, if we could grasp a hold of that, you would never struggle with another sin issue, another addiction, another, uh, you would, your faith would never waver anymore. You'd never think, you know, maybe, maybe God's not for, you wouldn't think that way because you'd be so, you would understand and everything would be worth giving up because of his great love. God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. And, and this word one actually means to unify. He says, I'm unified with the father. I'm unified with the Holy Ghost. And I want the church to be unified together as brothers and sisters with one purpose, one heart, one mind, working together for the Great Commission, for the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? I love John 17, verse 25 um, and 26. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these, and, and the word known there is actually speaking of intimacy, an intimate knowing of God. Not just like, hey, I know Johnny and I've only talked to him once. We're talking about an intimate knowledge, the way a husband would know his wife, the way a wife would know, just the deepest things, intimacy. He says, no one has known the Father. And I have declared them to them your name and will declare it. Okay? And he says here, that the love which with you love me may be in them and I in them. Here's the key. I have declared whose name? God's name. See, all through the Old Testament, God, God, God's called by different names that really talk about his attributes and what he's done for the people. But Jesus came to declare the name that the Father wanted to know by, and that is Father. See, the Old Testament saints didn't know, Jesus, didn't know the God as the Father. They knew him as Elohim. They knew him as um, Mikadish. They knew him as Titkenu. They knew him. These are all Hebrew names, by the way. They knew him by all his attributes, but they didn't know him as Daddy. And Jesus says, I have come, and I have come here for this purpose. I want to declare to them your name, your Father, your righteous Father. Father, you're awesome. You're my daddy. And I submit to you, Father. And, and, and I want them to know how much a daddy's love means. And I want them to know it. And it's going to be in them because it's in me. And he begins to just, this is his purpose to declare and to reveal the Father. And Satan over the years has, even when you read your Old Testament, we see all of this judgment. We see nations. We see what we would call genocide, things happening. And we say, God's got to not be loving. And the enemy gets us to look at the judgment, but we never look at the years and years and years where God was sending prophets to warn. God was sending his leaders to go and tell the people, please repent, please repent. And finally, judgment comes after 400 years and we say, oh, that God's mean. No, God's not mean. God is patient because I would have killed him a lot quicker. <laughs> Amen. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. Why? Because he, he, he's not going to cast out judgment. The Bible says he loves the righteous and the wicked. And he's waiting patiently that they might repent and turn to him. We have a good, good father. A loving father who cares and can concern for the needs of his children. This was the purpose of Jesus coming was to declare the name that couldn't be declared in the Old Testament. That is the name of father or daddy. And so, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Let's look together. Does anyone find it really hot in here? It's good? Okay. So, 
you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Okay? This is the New King James. I'm reading it out of the New Living. It says the same thing. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him, let's say it together. We call him daddy. The word Abba means daddy. You couldn't do that as an Old Testament saint. You couldn't call him daddy. You never, no, no, nobody understood him as father. Because in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, it says this. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the prophets or to the fathers by what? The prophets, okay? So God would give direction to the people. God would give orders to the people. And the only way they could reveal God and his character was by his attributes. And so we hear him being called Jehovah El Shaddai, which means the Lord Almighty. We hear him being called in the Old uh, Testament. We see him being called Adonai, which means my master. We hear God being called Yahweh, which means the Lord Jehovah. We hear Nissi, which is the Lord, my victory banner. We hear the word Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord, my healer. Jehovah Rohi, which means the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Shama, which means the Lord's presence. The Lord is here. And we, we see the attributes. They, they could understand God by what he was doing and how he was trying to minister. And they honored him as God. But the one thing they could not call him was Father. They only knew God by what he could do for them. And they understood that he was their creator and that they had to submit. But they couldn't have an intimate relationship because the spirit of adoption had not yet come. You know, the spirit of adoption came 2,000 years ago and fell on the disciples and it's here today. Isn't that good news? There's many, many more names. I'm not going to say them all. Hebrews 1 verse 2, next verse says here, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by what? By his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Did you know, last week I talked about seed time and harvest. How many remember that message? Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. It, it's a principle of seed time and harvest. If you sow a kernel of corn, you're not going to get an apple tree, right? You're going to get corn if you plant corn. And see, it, it, it's a spiritual principle. And so God could no longer, see, God was, was seeding prophets. He was seeding servants into the earth. And what was he reaping? He was reaping servants who were trying to honor God. But God said, no, I'm going to sow a son. And when he sowed a son and the son was placed in the grave, he was placed into the tomb. He was placed into the ground. Three days later, he rose again. And he was the firstborn among many brethren and sisters, which we are today because God planted a son so he would reap a harvest of sons and daughters. And if we can get that in our spirit, we're not just servants. We're sons and daughters of the most high God. Isn't that awesome? If you sow a servant, you reap a servant. You sow a son, you reap sons and daughters. And that's who we are. John chapter 17, verse 25 to 26. We already read it, so I'm going to pass it. But what's in the name? What, what is a father? A father is a man in relation to his natural children or his natural child. I'll say that again. A father is a man who is in relation to his children. And in the Old Testament, you couldn't be in relationship to the father. You had to go through the priest. But you couldn't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but through Jesus Christ, because he became the door, because he became the, the bridge to the Father. Now we can have a relationship with Daddy God. We can call him Father. We can come boldly into the throne room of grace. We can obtain mercy in time of need because we, we, we can just go in. We don't have to plead. We don't have to beg because we have free access because we're sons and daughters. Isn't that good news today? And when we understand this, we understand who he is. It changes everything. And I want to say this. There's more to Christianity than Jesus Christ alone. And in fact, if we're going to be a church that models Jesus, Jesus brought everything back to the Father. He said, it's not my words, it's the Father's words. It's not my works, it's the Father's work. It's not my kingdom, it's the Father's kingdom. And, and so we got to be going about doing the works of Jesus, which is the works of the 
Amen? Now, Jesus is absolutely essential. Without his sacrifice in his life, we die in our sins. We would, we would be separated from the Father. Without him, without our Savior, we have no hope. So we can never underestimate his importance. But a lot of churches, a lot of Christians, they don't know the Father. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. If we believe what Jesus actually said, then we have to accept that Jesus taught us to seek the Father first. To know the Father. He's constantly highlighting the Father. He's constantly emphasizes the importance of the Father. He said, I didn't come doing my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I'm here doing the will of the Father who sent me. And you know what? We're the children of God. And we're going to do the will of our Father. Amen? Jesus taught us how to pray. Let's look at this. He taught us how to pray. Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. In this manner, therefore, pray, Jesus in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? Do you know how many Christians are always talking to Jesus but never talk to the Father? You say, does that even matter? Yes, it does, and I'm going to explain why before we finish. They, they talk, Jesus, you know, help me. Je they're talking to Jesus all the time, talking to Jesus. But Jesus said, if we're going to be a church that models Jesus, we got to do what Jesus said. And Jesus said, when you pray in this manner, you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know the prayer. It's all about Father God. It's awesome. He taught us how to pray. And um, he says, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, again, in John chapter uh, 16, verse 15 to 16, and there's a lot of scripture. You can see why, because I'm hitting a really tough, tough topic. I'll give you the notes if you want them. Okay, look what Jesus said to the disciples. He's about to go to the cross. He says, all things that the, that, that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So Jesus is our intercessor. He's our advocate. Everything the Father has belongs to Jesus. He's declaring it to us. But look what he says in verse 23 to 25. Now he's talking about after he goes to the cross and resurrected, he says to his saints, or to his disciples, and in that day, after the resurrection, you will ask me nothing. Is that what it says? Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do. Amen? And so what, there's a transition happening here. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm your buddy. I'm your friend. I'm sharing. I'm explaining parables. I'm, I, I'm just sharing the Father with you. But, and you're asking all these questions. But there's a day coming when you no longer have to talk to me. But you can talk to the Father because I'm here to restore. I'm here to restore a relationship with the Father, who, by the way, is greater than I am. The Bible says that the Father raised Christ up. The Father raised him up, sat him at the right hand of God, and he, he, he made us rise up and sit with him in authority. It's the Father. It's the Father. Amen? And so all of these other religions in the world, uh, even from New Age movement all the way through to the different religions, are all trying to touch connect with the, the father of all spirits. They call it a force. They call it whatever. They're trying to connect with the spiritual force, the father of all spirits. But the doorway is Jesus Christ. Any other way, if you try to get in through any other way, you're a robber and a thief. There's only one way to the father. That's through Jesus Christ. So he's so essential. But there's a difference. He says, until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, you will receive. That your joy will be filled. So Jesus is saying, ask the Father in whose name? In his name. In that way, Jesus modeled for us how to pray. Why? Because Jesus is in submission. He's under the mission of the Father. Do you know that's what submission means? So a lot of people are afraid of the word submit. I don't want to submit to anybody. Do you know what submission means? It means to be under the mission. And if you're not under the mission of the Father, if you're not under the mission of God, uh, then, then no one will be under your mission because God won't give you one. Amen? 
Submission is actually a good word. All right? Another thing Jesus taught us, do you guys want a few more things? You got to look like you're hungry or I'm not going to give it to you. You guys want a few more things? All right, okay. All right, all right. I know it's a lot. It's a heavy one, but he taught us how to worship. And, and like, let's, let's just really look at this verse here with new eyes this morning. John chapter 4, verse 23. The hour is coming. It's already here. Okay, John chapter 4, verse 23. We'll just get it up. The hour is here and is already coming when the true worshipers, are you true worshipers? The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For Jesus is seeking such to worship him. Is that what it says? The Father is seeking such to worship him. So God, see, see, Jesus is talking about how to worship. He says, when you pray, pray to the Father. When you worship, worship, to the, worship the Father. I am here not to exalt myself, but to exalt my Father who is greater than I. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm your Lord and I'm your King, but I'm providing a way. And so we can go into relationship with the Father. It's awesome. And so the question is, do we emphasize the Father in our lives? You know, Jesus spoke the words of the Father. And the devil's deception is that God is a harsh, distant father and Jesus is merciful and loving. Because Jesus, by the way, came, you know, uh, because God poured out his wrath on Jesus. So we see God as this, this at a subconscious level, we see God as this, this harsh judge that's up there that just wants to nail us. And the devil wants to make sure we interpret the scripture through his eyes. Do you know the devil knows scripture? Did you know the devil stood with Jesus and said, it is written, you know? And he began to quote scripture to Jesus when he was being tempted. The devil can quote scriptures through preachers too and give you a wrong interpretation of the heart and the purpose of God. And I don't want to interpret the scripture through the enemy's eyes. I want to do it through the eyes of the spirit. And I want to know the truth about my father in heaven. So God, the devil's deception is God is harsh, he's distant, he's a father that's far away. And, he, you know, that if it wasn't for Jesus, he'd just wipe us all out. There's no mercy in him. Jesus is mercy, the, the, God is judgment. That's the way people see it. It's not true. Jesus is merciful and loving, but so is the father. In fact, the father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because in his heart, he wanted to restore mankind into relationship with him. And so the devil wants us to think that, well, God is just and he's, he's just hard and he's ready to hand out judgments, everything you do wrong. But his heart, the father being the beginning of all spirits, is love. It's mercy. It's kindness. And so at a subconscious level, we begin to disconnect the father and the son as if one's harsh and justice and one is mercy and truth. And it's not true. And even the disciples, the early disciples, they, they thought the same way. They didn't know any better. And they said in John chapter 14, uh, verse 8 to 10, it says, Philip said, Lord, show us the father and we'll be satisfied. Okay, it'll be sufficient for us. Look what he says. Jesus replied, I've been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am, am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. So, you know, what happens is some denominations have grabbed a hold of this and said, well, Jesus only. It's just Jesus is the Father and the Holy Spirit together. That's not the case. He's not saying I'm not separate from the Father. He's saying that we're one because I represent him because he lives in me. And I'm, t I'm telling you what he told me to tell you. Does that make sense? And they were saying, show us the Father. So when you read the Gospels and you see how Jesus deals with the woman at the well. And how he's willing to forgive her adultery. How he's willing to deal. The woman who was caught in an act of an adultery, he, he was willing to say, go and sin no more. Who's here to judge? When you see that kind of heart, you're seeing the Father's heart. I said, you're seeing the Father's heart. And when I read that, it just causes me to want to burst inside and say, Father, I want to, if you have that kind of love for me, I, I'll serve you with everything. 
And this is important. John chapter 14, verse 24. says, anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. My words are not my own. Jesus was speaking what was coming from the Father's heart, not from his heart. So you can't separate Jesus and the Father. They are one. Unified. Jesus said plainly, I and the Father are one in purpose and character. And their character can be summed up as one thing, and that is love, which is found in 1 John 4, 8, that he is love. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So one of the things you want, if you want to walk away from deception, you need to look and say, is the love of, is the love of God in that house of God? Amen? I'm going to say that again. Is the love of God in the house of God? And so if you go into a church or a ministry where there's this critical spirit and everyone's looking down at you constantly, um, then the love of God probably isn't in that house. Probably good to get away from it. Because anything that doesn't sound like a loving father talking to a son or daughter is not God. All right? Now... <clears throat> The Father was also the source of God's of Jesus' power to do miracles. We know that. We see in the scripture all the way through. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, we see a couple of scriptures after the cross. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested or proved by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. And we got people going, Jesus is the healer. Jesus, yes, he is the healer, but... The Father's the healer. So when you pray for the sick, you pray, in the, you pray be healed in, in the name of Jesus, but you're praying to the Father because the Father is Jehovah Rapha. He's the healer. And Jesus came doing the works of the Father, allowing the Father to work through him. Amen? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with great power. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because the Father was with him. And so it's very clear as we look through the scripture, we see that Jesus claimed that the father was with him and everything was about his father's business. And that's important because we need to be that way as well. Amen. Everything Jesus did and said, in fact, the entire Bible leads us to the father. That's what it does. Are you father-centered or Jesus-centered in your worship and in your prayer? A lot of, it's not so bad in this region, and I'll tell you why. Because we had a movement in Toronto called the Father's Blessing, where a lot of us were influenced. So we understand, we talk to the Father, and we understand, you know, we understand the Father. But there's a lot of Christendom, especially in North America, and it's like, all of their worship songs are about Jesus. All of their teaching is about Jesus. All of everything's about Jesus. And, 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 and I, it's like, it's not about Jesus. It's about the Father. I'm going to say that again. It's not all about Jesus. It's about the Father. And, I, and I'm saying that carefully because if you accidentally are praying and you talk to Jesus, you're not going to offend the Father because they're one. Is a, you're talking to my son. I want you to talk to me. You know, that's not the way it works, right? You can talk. You can have fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we need to understand that our fellowship is with the Father. And I'm going to talk to you for just a couple minutes why this is important. Um, the issue is subconscious. This is the issue, okay? Because Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends, right? Is that what he said? And I don't know about you, but a friend is actually someone who is, it's a place of safety. There's someone who will, they'll give you their ear when you're in a hard time. They'll give you your shoulder to cry on when you're going through tough times. They have understanding. And I know in my own life that there were certain times where I was going through a tough time. And I wouldn't go to my father, right here, who's taking a nap. I would, <laughs> that's all right. Sorry, I had to do that. I'm sorry. Happy Father's Day. So, 
I wouldn't go to him about a certain issue I was struggling with. I'd go to a friend. Why? Because I know that the friend would say, would be safety. They'd say, oh, I'm here, I'm here to, uh, you know, you need to do this and that and this and that. And they'd go about their business and they'd kind of hear me and comfort me and everything. And then I could just continue doing what I want to do anyway. Do you know what I mean? Like how many know we need an ear to hear? We just want to dump. But then we don't change. Now, if I would have went to my father with the same situation, well, son, you need to do this, this, and this, you need to do it now, and it would come across harsh, and it would come across like, you know, but, but how, how many know who, who loves me more, the friend or, or the father? And the father doesn't care about my temporal comfort. He wants to see me grow and develop and to become the man God's called me to be. Amen? And so we, we, need, to be, we need to understand that the father's desire for us is, is, is to... to to give us tough love sometimes, to direct us, and to, because he wants to mold us and shape us, and he wants to form us. And at a subconscious level, we're aware of that. We're like, if I talk to the Father, he's going to tell me to deal with my stuff. But I can talk to Jesus, because he's my friend, and he understands. After all, he was tempted in all ways that I have been, yet he didn't sin. So I can talk to him, because he understands me, but the Father doesn't understand me. Now, we'd never say this, but we think it, right? So it's easier to talk to Jesus because he's a buddy. He's, you know, he's my bro. He's my big brother. He's my Lord and Savior. And he, he understands. But to talk to the Father, he's going to try to direct me and correct me. Does that make sense? And the Bible actually says, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 to 18. Come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Next verse. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And you know what I find really, really interesting? Is that when I started praying to the Father, I, step, I, I just started, God was always trying to say, no, you need to do this. You need to change this. You got to change the attitude. I was like, really? I want to talk to Jesus for a while. <laughs> he understands me, you know? But the Father will correct us. He wants us to come out from, he wants us to be separate. Why? Because he wants what's best for you and me. He knows where he wants, he's, he's created us with a purpose. He knows the plans he has for us. And if you go to the Father, you can say, you're off tilt or you're off course. And he'll begin to redirect you. And at a subconscious level, I guess we know that. So we, we have this idea, okay, the Father's going to try to, you know, but it's good for us. Does that make sense to everybody? Jesus represents like the best friend that we can relate to. And he's our, he's our God. He's our Lord. He's our, he's our friend. He understands where I'm going through. But the Father represents something a little bit different. Right? Think of the Father. Maybe you had issues with your natural father. There was abandonment issues. There was abuse. There was rejection. Um, there, were, there were issues there. Well, God already deals with that. He says, if, if your earthly fathers being wicked know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask? So God, 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 you can't compare God to your earthly father. He's perfect. But his, his will is for us to, to move forward. He wants to raise us up. He wants to discipline us, but he also wants to comfort us. But he's willing to allow temporal discomfort in order to help you develop the character you need. And we know that. So let's talk to Jesus instead, right? But God wants us to learn to go to him. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, it says this, My father, don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. And so when I see my kids and they're doing a little bit too much of something and you know, you're supposed to be doing their chores. I, I, I will come down and I sometimes not even seem nice about it. Because I love and I want to see better for my children. How many know what I'm talking about? Where a best friend would just be like, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't think this is a good idea that you're doing that. But I'm going out, I'll see you later. And they walk away and you can stay in your mess. But a father, you know, a friend will say, I wouldn't really date that guy. He's probably not so good for you. A father would say, give me the baseball bat. We're going to go deal with this right now. Because a father loves and he cares about your future. And so here's the challenge I'm putting before you. As you begin to talk to the father, you need to be aware that God's going to begin to direct you and correct you and, and adjust you. There's two things that will happen. You'll begin to find a center in an adoptive state where you're just so connected with the father. I don't even know how to explain it. But it's just you'll feel so fulfilled in that relationship. But you'll also 
find yourself being more directed and corrected. And it's for your good. Amen? Does that make sense? And so, people don't like change. Friends won't push us to change. They just give us advice. But the fathers will always push us to change. Our father is our greatest encourager. He has placed that in all of us as fathers to be encouragers. And um, I want to encourage you this week to just start to talk to the father. Maybe you already do that. Maybe this is a message just kind of reaffirming what you already know. But let the father heal your hearts. And, and, and um, it's important. You know, you know, the Bible says, let no, you know, call no man father, but only the father in heaven. You know, Jesus said that. And so, of course, I don't really believe that speaking about your natural father, but in a spiritual sense, like a spiritual father. And it's always been funny because when I get around Catholic priests, right, sometimes I'm at a ministerial or, you know, I've been around other ministers and the Catholic priests show up. Eh? And it's funny because they're all like, yeah, they call him, hey, Father Bob. And I'm like, hey, priest Bob. And they're like, you know, you should be calling me father. No, I call no man father. I have one spiritual father. And that's my own conviction. So if you want to call a man father or so-and-so, you can do that. But I... I want to model Jesus. Amen? And I want to share his love. And I really feel that God wants to challenge us to just be aware. This is, this is Father's Day, and we just want to honor the Father. And, and he's put it in us as fathers um, to be our children's greatest motivators, to raise them up. Uh, and, and that's what we're called to do. Let, we're